Good morning, everybody. This is Randy Welsh with the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. I want to thank you for joining us today for the, I think the third in our series on wilderness stewardship advocacy, wilderness stewardship advocacy 201 today, with a focus on interacting with congressional offices and members. Um, have with me here today, um, Andrew Downs from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and Anders Reynolds from the Southern Environmental Law Center, um, who will be sharing some of their experience working with Congress. And um, let me just pop this in here and we'll get up and running in just a second. Too many buttons all requesting attention all at once. Okay. Um, all righty. So I don't know why my screen is all of a sudden going crazy on me. Just one moment, this is computer is acting up on me. Hey Randy, um, while we got a minute, Brendan will be joining us at 1.30. Okay. All righty. Um, yeah, something just happened on my Screen, so we will just roll with it. All right, well, thank you, everybody. This is, you get to see the sausage being made in the process. Um, all right, well, thank you again. This is the third in our series of Wilderness Stewardship Advocacy. This is Wilderness Stewardship Advocacy 201, where our focus is going to be on our congressional interactions, um, working with members. Today we have Andrews Reynolds, Andrew Downs, who you've, we've introduced you to. Uh, Brendan Mizelik will be with us a little later with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy as well. Um, today, again, our focus is on congressional interactions. We plan to talk a little bit about the basics, the how-to basics of stewardship advocacy, um, the importance of considering appropriations, uh, who is involved in, con in Congress and how do you go about contacting them, um, how a member office is organized, what that means in terms of who you're going to meet with, what, how to go about getting a meeting with a, a member themselves. We're going to talk about other congressional groups, some of the materials that you'll want to have prepared for those meetings, um, involvement in other committee Assign, or other congressional activities such as committees, committee hearings, providing testimony. And we're going to finish with, again, the ask as we get prepared for our October webinar, which is all about the ask, what it is you want to ask Congress for. So um, with that, again, just a reminder that Wilderness Stewardship Advocacy at its core is just sharing information about the places we love with the people who can make a difference with a specific intention to make improvements in how they are managed. And whether that be Congress, the agency, or the rest of the public, stewardship advocacy is a role that we all share in helping people to understand what wilderness is, the importance and value of it, and what it's gonna to take to continue it into the future. So I hope you embrace that role as we go through our webinar today and then in days to come. So I'm going to turn the time over to, to Andrew and Anders, who are going to talk first about how to work with Washington congressional offices, the how-tos. Yeah, thanks, Randy, and I appreciate everybody being here. Um, I'm Andrew Downs. I work with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I've been participating uh, in working with Congress for oh, about seven years now. Um, 
Anders, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Anders Reynolds. I'm with the Southern Environmental Law Center I'm here in their DC office. Um, I've been, been involved with wilderness and public lands advocacy for uh, almost a decade now. Great. Do you want to start off by just talking about how member offices are organized, maybe? Yeah, um, I'd love to. So um, the number and type of congressional offices can be, I think, overwhelming for people who are new to Capitol Hill. Um, but the purpose of those offices is to provide logistical, political, and even substantive support for members of Congress. Um, each member of Congress has an individual office um, here in DC that's known as their personal office. In addition, they also have at least one office and often many offices um, within their home state or their home district. Um, members who hold key leadership or, or committee leadership positions also have additional staff and offices within the congressional complex. But for our purposes today, we're gonna to be talking about um, those personal offices of which each member has one. So the, the average house office features about 10 staffers, uh, while the Senate office has about 20 to 25 staffers. Um, on the Senate side, uh, uh, a more than small amount of those staffers, usually five or six, are typically devoted to handling and responding to constituent mail, of which the senators in particular get a whole, whole bunch. Um, but Senate and House personal offices are primarily um, issue oriented and they address a wide range of issues and inquiries that are often politically focused. Um, I think later we're going to talk about committees a little bit. Committee offices are usually substantively oriented to focus on one singular issue. Um, so as a result, committee staffers often have a little bit more subject matter expertise than the the staff in the personal office who are often juggling two or three issues um, in the Senate and sometimes up to 10 in the House. Um, the organiza organizational structure for personal offices on the Hill, it, it varies based on the emphasis of the member and their functions within um, um, their party. Uh, for instance, a, a press secretary might report to the chief of staff or even directly to a member of Congress depending on that press secretary's relationship with that member. Um, so responsibilities and priorities world vary a little, but generally the structure is as follows. I'm just gonna paint kind of the, the general generic um, organizational structure and the staff. So at the top is the, the chief of staff, usually the most senior staffer, um, serves as the office um, number one, they manage the policy, they manage the communications, they manage the admin, while also advising the member on political matters. Um, reporting to the chief of staff is um, the policy team, which researches, drafts, um, uh, and communicates about legislation and informs the member on a range of issues before Congress and in committee. Um, and usually at the top of that policy team, is someone called the legislative director and who manages a crew of legislative assistants under, under them. The legislative director runs that policy shop. They're, they're, they're the, the member that's sort of singularly responsible for reporting to the member um, on what votes are gonna happen that day and, and make a vote recommendation to them. Though oftentimes the chief of staff will um, chime in with some more political information about it. Um, and then finally the communication team also reports to the chief of staff. Um, the communications team manages media requests. It executes communication strategy about what the member is doing and raises awareness about issues important to the member. Um, and, and then finally, there's a, an admin team, which kind of works to keep the office organized and is accountable to the member and their constituents, but is primarily focused on, uh, on HR issues, mail, that sort of thing. So the policy team, the admin team, the communication team all report to the chief of staff. On the House side, they're obviously much smaller than they are on the Senate side. Um, but I think I think that that's a that's sort of a rough outline of, of how an office is organized. Um, Andrew, do you want me to go ahead and hop into who to contact and all that stuff? I'm happy to. Well, how about I um, share what I've got there and you can fill in the gaps. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Um, 
So if, if you're looking for a, a meeting with a member, I think, and building off of our last webinar, one of the first key uh, relationships that you're gonna kind of ping is that local representative for that member's office. So whether that's um, in, in district uh, or representing part of your state, um, you know, our advice has always been to make sure if you're interested in advocating for public land stewards, making sure that you're a known quantity in the representative's local office. And I think one of the good things to do is to use your desire for a meeting to continue to build that relationship with that um, local staff member. So popping into the office, picking up the phone, saying, hey, I'd like a meeting uh, with the boss about whatever, whatever topic you're interested in. And then making sure that person is as informed as uh, anyone on the team about what, what you're looking for in that, in that meeting. Um, that can kind of act as a little bit of a dry run uh, for the meeting in case you do get it. Um, but what you also want to do is, is create a situation where after you request the meeting and the legislative aide or the chief of staff or somebody might be curious what, uh, you know, what's the context of the meeting, they're going to call uh, their local staff member and say, hey, you know, I, I know you work with the Appalachian Trail down your way. You know, they, they want a meeting about um, this particular legislation. Do you know where they're coming from? And you want that person essentially on their staff team locally to be your advocate. Um, so, so that initial contact is really important. Um, each office will also have a scheduler. Um, and so that, that's one of the first places to, um, to call as well. Um, you know, you call up, can I speak to the scheduler? I'd like to request a meeting, they'll transfer you. Um, that schedule may also, uh, ping that that local uh, staff member as well um, just trying to get a read on a variety of things that might importance um, timetable etc uh, that might help them schedule a meeting with the boss um, and then after that you know you may you may uh, be on the schedule um, for the member but may not meet with the member you may have to first meet with a legislative uh, assistant um, or somebody else on the staff Again, an opportunity to kind of act as a dry run, but really also educate that person uh, on the meeting as well. So, if you if you do, or if you are looking for a, a member meeting, uh, point being, there's there's going to be a number of folks on staff that you're going to have to make sure are well versed in uh, the subject at hand, and kind of coordinating, able to coordinate with their own team um, on scheduling the meeting and. and and carving out time, so uh, it's it's relatively complicated, and it also is uh, is uh, subject to change. I think a lot of times you might um, be planning on meeting with a, a member, um, and that might get you know moved at the last minute or bumped at the last minute. And also, if you're if you're new to a relationship, if you're just building a relationship, there's a good chance that you won't meet with the member um, the first couple times that that you request it. Um, just out of scheduling concerns and obviously busy folks, only only one person there leaving the office. Um, so you're, you're going to be, you want to plan for educating an entire team, right, uh, as part of your request for the meeting. Um, and that's actually a really good thing because after you do have a, a meeting, let's say it's a successful meeting where you got to go over a number of things um, that are of interest to you or your organization, they're going to go back and talk about it all. And so if you've got a really informed group there, I think you're preparing them to have a much more robust and ultimately fruitful conversation about whatever you're whatever you're interested in. Anders, what do I lead out? I, I don't think anything. You did a great job. I you know there's there's two ways to get a, a meeting with a member of Congress, and that's to know them personally or to cultivate a relationship with their staffer. Um, and the the former is a really great shortcut, and if you've got it, then I recommend you flex that muscle, but the most common path is is the second way, is through the staff. And like Andrew mentioned, it's um, it's a really good way to have a dry run, and it's a really good way to build an advocate that you know is there 24/7 inside that personal office, um, making the same case you would make um, to that member of Congress. So 
Um, it, it takes a lot of work. There's a lot of staff work. And it's important to keep in mind that staffers have an immense amount of work on their plate. So, you know, the easier you can, you can make their lives, um, the better. I, I always say that the point of any um, congressional meeting isn't really to solve anything in that meeting. It's to be asked back to another meeting. Um, if you find that a staffer is answering your emails and answering your phone calls and inviting you back to talk more, then you're in a really good position. Uh, a much better position than one in which you take a meeting and they never reach out to you again because they're not curious. So the goal is always to have another meeting. I know that sounds really bureaucratic and probably too inside the beltway, but it's, it's the best way to develop a relationship over time. So guys, before we move to a different topic, um, would you like to speak to anything about the difference between congressional advocacy and agency advocacy? Um, because we talked a lot about agencies last time, but what what are the key differences that people should be aware of? I don't I don't work with the agencies, so Andrew, I will leave this in your capable hands. Yeah, well, I think I think um, reflecting on the on the differences in their roles, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, members of Congress are there um, setting policy. Uh, making laws, developing legislation, uh, appropriating funds, and agencies are are operating under um, the rules, regulations, and resources that have been provided by Congress. So um, you kind of want to keep those those lines um, in mind when you're dealing with with the agencies or the Congress, and and kind of stay in those lanes. You know, not necessarily talk to the agency directly. Um, about you know legislative changes or changes in in congress or or you know um, talking about critiques of congress and I, I think vice versa now each one of those will have exceptions um but in general as you're developing relationships i think the most valuable time spent is in the place where each one of those bodies can make the most change and while they do operate um across those lines from time to time those are going to be more extreme situations where you're asking, you know, a member of Congress to uh, address a problem within the agency. That that is really, um, you know, that is, that is really, I think, a, a more uncommon um, uh, ask. We'll say when when you're asking a, a member to reach directly out to an agency or or, or something like that. Um, but also, it's not a great use of your time. I mean, if, if, if the agency. You really want to talk to them about the changes that that are within their power to make, and so just knowing um, the the differences of purpose of those two agencies, and then crafting the type of ask and the type of conversation you want around the the um, the ability of each uh, entity to make change within their own tools and mechanisms. I I, I think for me is really important, and and a, and a key difference. Um, you know, if if you go in there, you know, talking about developing legislation. Um, with the agency, you, you know, they might be interested and, and listen to you, um, but man, maybe your time might have been better um, uh, spent talking about internal policy priorities uh, with the agency and um, and how those are affecting you on the ground, and your ability to steward the resource and uh, and the differences that you'd like to see occur within the agency. I think your, your time would be much, much better spent in that regard. So um, just a little bit there about differences in working with uh, the agencies versus Congress. Know the roles of each of them and, and stick to those playbooks, I think is, would be my advice. Okay, so before we talk about committees, what would be a couple of key tips about getting that member meeting and maybe a couple of examples that you'd like to share about successful member meetings that you've participated in. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start first there. I think a key, a key um, part about getting a committee or excuse me, getting a member meeting is knowing what interests that member of Congress. And so whether that's the legislation they're currently working on, whether that's um, you know, whether that's a, a committee assignment they have or whether that's a personal interest. Um, I think uh, one of the one of the 
you know, most excited, exciting meetings I have when I, I go to Capitol Hills with Morgan Griffith. Morgan Griffith uh, is, um, you know, a Tea Party Republican. I think a lot of folks out there might not um, might not have an image of a Tea Party Republican when it comes to conservation or, or public land stewardship. But uh, Morgan Griffith is also a huge uh, birder. Uh, you know, loves. Uh, he has this checklist of um, of birds he's seen in the wild. I I've actually had a meeting with him where he's been leading a a, a bird watching event uh, on the National Ball, and it's come straight from that. Um, so we kind of tailor a lot of our meeting requests around those interests. And that, that's not a committee assignment, not some legislation he's working on. It's really a personal interest. So we'll say, hey, you know, we've preserved a property uh, in your district for the Appalachian Trail that has, you know, migratory bird habitat on it that we're working to um, to reclaim. Love to talk to you through that. And um, surprised, well, not surprised anymore, but initially really surprised at how um, engaged he was in those meetings, and it really did open a door for us to talk about a lot of other things around um, AT preservation, also in uh, empowering volunteers on the AT. You know, it was just a, a, a great sort of conversation starter. So um, knowing the member and knowing how the subject at hand relates to their personal interests, I think, is, is, has been a tactic that, that really has worked for me in certain situations in the past. Yeah, to, totally agree. And to, to, that's a great example. And to give a very, a one that's similar um, in in sort of the years leading up to the the Tennessee Wilderness Act being passed a couple of years ago, um, one of the the key um, legislators uh, involved was Bill Rowe from northeastern Tennessee. And, and while Rowe had an outdoor background, what he was really passionate about was um, veterans was returning veterans and taking care of veterans. In fact, he was chair of the veterans committee in the house and um, eventually uh, took a meeting with some advocates in which he learned that one of them was a veteran and, and relied on getting into outdoor spaces to sort of clear their head and, and reconnect. And Roe was sort of all in from that moment. Once he sort of saw like how beneficial this was for or a constituency that he cared deeply about, um, but also had like a political connection to on committee. Um, and that, that ended up being a really good connection. I would say my best advice is that a little bit of research goes a long way. You'll just do a little bit of reading about what committees the member is on. You can, you can make some best guesses about what they care about from that. If you could do a little bit of research about the political realities in their district, probably figure out what kind of person they're hoping to talk to and just be savvy if you know if a, if a friend of the member is coming in with you to talk about um whatever you got to talk about have them request a meeting like don't request the meeting yourself have, have the familiar face be making the request and it's more likely that it's going to end up um on the docket of the congressman for the day and they're going to say oh i want to pop in and see what billy bob or Billy Sue was up to, and then and then hopefully you'll have you know a moment, even a short moment, to to make a personal connection. And um, I'll just add one more thing that's just specific um, um, to House members. You know, making sure that that you are accompanied by uh, someone from the district, right? So it you know some of your organizations may have a, a footprint that's. Um, pretty large spans multiple congressional districts um, having a voter there who can express um, a, a personal interest in the issue at hand I think always um, checks a box uh, for the scheduler and for you know the legislative assist uh, assistance to roll that up in a level of priority that makes it more likely that you'll get a member if you've got you know I, I live um, in Southwest Virginia um, but but my my work on the Appalachian Trail spans a number of districts. If I'm going to request a meeting, let's say in in Maryland, for example, where I don't live, I want to make sure I've got a local volunteer or local club representative with me making that ask. And so, you know, not only am I talking about important issues around the management of the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, but hey, I've also got some voters from your district who care enough to join me 
in this meeting and, and raising this um, level of concern to your office. And, and that seems to work really well. I mean, I think a lot of schedulers or a lot of offices will ask that right out of the gate. You know, I'd like to, if you say, I'd, I'd like a meeting with, with this um, representative, they'll say, are you from the district, right? Um, and obviously kind of not necessarily weeding out, but helping establish priority for, for how they build that schedule. So always, you can always bring a voter from the district with you uh, in scheduling that meeting and, and definitely in in-person meetings as well. All right, well, we know that members are critically important because they're the ones that have the vote, but we, but committees are where a lot of the work actually gets done. So let's just switch our focus there. And how, tell us a little bit more about the committees and how do you get a meeting in front of a committee? That's a great question. Um, so each congressional committee employs its own staff. Um, this is, this is one place where the House actually outnumbers the Senate. The, the average number of committee staff in the House is usually pushes about 70. Around the Senate, it's more like 50 employees. Um, committee budgets and workloads affect the number of employees each committee have. But the staff are hired to perform work in accordance with the rules of both that committee and the respective chambers. So professional staff on committee spend their time briefing members on policy issues within a committee's jurisdiction, uh, planning agendas, reviewing agency and committee budget documents, uh, coordinating hearings and markups and business meetings, drafting and analyze legislation and amendments, um, preparing legislation when it goes to the House. Um, they assist members in committee meetings, but they're also usually the, the actual staffers that you see on the floor with members when they're giving speeches. Um, they also maintain liaison with their counterparts in the agencies and the, the other chamber. Um, so they do a, a lot of work. Um, at, at the top, sort of the, the chief of staff position on a committee, that title is called a staff director. And um, they really oversee everything happening at the committee level. Um, most committees also have a chief counsel and a counsel. They have um, some legal help. Um, to assist them as they're monitoring implementation of laws and the administration of programs and to oversee any um, oversight they're doing. Um, underneath that, you'll have a professional staff member um, who's sort of the legislative assistant of the committee and probably where most people on this call would have the majority of their interaction with a, with a committee staff member. Um, they also have investigators and auditors and uh, economists and their own press and communication shops. So it's a really busy place. Um, my experience with committees um, um, being where I think most of the people on this call are is you're probably not gonna get a committee meeting unless you go through a member's office. Um, and that's because the committee's just probably not gonna meet with any group, not just um, uh, groups involved with public lands work, but any group that doesn't have live legislation um, being considered in front of it. Um, and at that point, if, there, if you do have live legislation being considered in front of the committee, you've probably spent a lot of time with a member's office, hammering out a draft, getting it introduced, um, getting that member comf comfortable with the political realities surrounding that bill. So I I'm not going to say always, but almost always your connection to committee is going to come through a relationship that you've cultivated uh, with a personal office. Now, that said, there's probably many people on this call who have really good relationships with folks on House Natural Resources Committee, like Brandon Bogato, or maybe you know David Brooks or someone else on, on Senate ENR. And those relationships come over time, and you're usually called upon in those situations to meet with them when they need advice on a topic that's specific to what you're working on. Um, so, um, I, my advice, you can call a committee and, and when they pick up the phone, say you wanna meet with the professional staff member in charge of X and you may connect with them on the phone. Um, but my, my experience of how this works is you usually get to know committee staff through personal staff. And I don't say that to discourage you from reaching out to the committee. I'm saying that to encourage you the way Andrew did a few minutes ago to continue building those relationships with personal staff. They pay off time and time again. 
And Anders, you, you bring up a good point that I, I just think I'll mention briefly. One of the outcomes of being successful in building these relationships is that they may come to you with questions unrelated about unrelated to what you may want to talk about. There may be things around public land management that they hear, you know, you know, in their own day to day work that they have questions about and specifically questions about how they will be, um, you know, some issue might affect their district. So it's it's common, I think, once you have a good relationship with some of these offices to receive a call from a from a, a legislative assistant or, or somebody that you're used to working with in the office and hearing about like, hey, you know, I, I hear this is going on. What's your take? Um, and I think that is a great back to what Andrew said, which is a good point. It's that's a great way to get another meeting and to continue building a relationship, no matter what your opinion on the outcome is. Um, but I, the other thing that's really important is to avoid um, kind of a hot take and, you know, figure out when you, when that person might need follow up and then doing, you know, a little bit of due diligence to make sure that, that you're uh, expressing a, a, a well-reasoned opinion or you get a sense of what's going on uh, out there in the field, so to speak. So, um, you know, things move really quickly in Washington sometimes, but just because they're asking the question doesn't mean that you have to answer it immediately. And my experience is that, um, that they're generally going to understand, you know, answer similar to, that's interesting. Let me get back to you in a couple of days, see what I can find out. Um, it's a really good sign that you've done a really good job developing relationships with that office. Um, and so you want to provide really valuable, um, valuable feedback if they're, if they're asking you a kind of unsolicited question. And Randy, if you're talking, you're on mute. I am talking. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so we've been joined. We've been joined by Brendan from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, in an earlier stewardship webinar, uh, Brendan was going to talk to us about the importance of budgets and how the budget process uh, applies to our efforts at advocacy. Um, we weren't able to to really get that message across because of some network issues, but we have Brendan back with us today. And so, Brendan, I'm going to turn the time over to you to talk a little bit about the importance of budgets in the budget process in our stewardship advocacy. Hi, Randy. Uh, I apologize for not being on camera. I am apparently experiencing some technical difficulty that if I tried to fix would prevent me from speaking to you right now. So just Hopefully you can appreciate the ATC logo and my voice. Uh, so I think that what is important to remember, and you'll hear this from folks in the executive branch a lot, is the budget reflects the priorities of the administration. And if you want to see what you care about reflected in the administration's agenda, you need to be able to find it in the president's budget. So. The president's budget is an annual phenomenon. It's by statute supposed to be released by the first week in February. Um, and it is the reflection of the previous year's work and how it will be represented in the next year. And one of the things that is important and confusing to recognize about working in budgeting and appropriations is that you're sort of existing in three years simultaneously. You are planning for the next year while working in the current year and uh, considering a process that mostly occurred the last year. So you'll be spending money for one year while looking how to spend money for the next year. And it can be a little confusing and a little tricky, but the more that you do it, the more that you think, oh, okay, well, this is this fiscal year, this is that fiscal year, so on and so forth. But without getting into sort of the nitty gritty of the budget process or of um, how agencies put together their budgets, 
which requires you to start working on something more or less a full year, a year and a half before you actually want to see it happen. I'm going to talk a little bit about how Congress receives the budget, um, because I think that there may be better people who have presented on how the budget process works in the agencies, um, which is laborious but fun. So Congress really needs the president's budget. Congress needs the president's budget because for Congress, it's like receiving a group work document that they then get to edit and move things around in. It is at best a um, roadmap to move forward in appropriating funds for the following fiscal year. It is at worst a set of recommendations that they're going to throw away. But what Congress doesn't know on its own, that it really relies on the president's budget to suggest, if not declare, is how much the money the government needs to do particular things and to have particular offices operate. So Congress will, as they say, plus up or decrease support for a particular area of the government, but they can't do so if they do not, if they cannot decrease it so much, they eliminate it accidentally. And they can't give it so much money that it then doesn't know what to do with the amount of money that it's given. So while there's no formal um, restriction on how much above or beyond the president's budget Congress can go, Congress will hew more or less to a reasonable zone around whatever the number that the administration puts forth for a particular agency or program is, with the exception of, I think many of us saw the Trump administration's budgets where it was just sort of wildly, um, the president requested to zero things out <laughs> without really um, making the, making a, actually trying to get it done. They just said, we don't need money for this. And so Congress looked at the president's budget under the Trump administration and by and large said, well, thanks for, thanks for showing up, but we're going to do our own thing now. So Congress receives the president's budget the first week in February. And that's when the appropriations process really begins to kick off with budget committee, a separate committee of Congress considering the president's recommendations. We don't usually have the kind of wild budget and appropriations process that we're living through now because we don't often have um, both houses of Congress and the presidency to pursue a reconciliation process, which I won't get into because it is, I think, pretty deep in the weeds and it's not really what I'm here to talk about. But the, the thing that is important to bring to your conversations with congressional offices in discussing what's in the budget and how it helps you is whether you think it's enough and whether you think that there are policy considerations that should be included that are not necessarily present in the history of the agency's operations or are not discussed at all in the budget justifications for the agencies. Because Congress does have an ability to, through the appropriations process, and some of us are seeing through the reconciliation process, direct the activity of the executive branch more than just giving the executive branch money, more than just saying, you've asked for this much money for this agency or this program, so we're going to give you this much money. There are strings that can be attached to the money that goes to the executive branch, and those are strings that if they are present, we would like to benefit our perspective and our mission, our goals. Um, you won't be alone if you do that. Uh, and it is often difficult to have policy objectives advanced through appropriations. So in bringing these ideas and bringing these goals to your members of Congress, you don't you, you should not necessarily expect more than simply getting to understand, uh, getting the members and the staffers to understand from more perspectives how your work is done, what's important for your work, and the opportunities to support your work. I think that, and I, maybe this should have been my first sentence, that um, I was asked to talk about appropriations and, and budgeting 
to differentiate it from authorization, which is what we think about when a bill is passed by a committee. You know, the, the 21st Century Forest Stewardship Act, it moves through Senate Energy and Natural Resources, it gets voted on the floor, moves through the House, it's signed by the president. That's an authorization that tells uh, the government how to function. Appropriations are what allow the government to function. It's where the money comes from. Um, and so if you can add strings to the money, sometimes you want to do that. You don't want to add so many strings, however, that you hamstring, you make it impossible for the agency to operate or um, to operate in the way that you are used to them operating. So it is sort of a, you know, the law is kind of a, a living thing and a live wire. And sometimes you move one thing and uh, there's a domino effect throughout the rest of your management system, um, sometimes with unintended consequences. So you can use appropriations. You have to be careful. The budget reflects the priority of the administration. If you don't see your priorities reflected on the budget, you can't guarantee that they will be reflected in appropriations and you can't guarantee that they will be advanced. So work with your members of Congress to acclimate them to issues of importance for your work. Um, tell them how that work is funded on the government side and remind them to ask questions of the administration on how the administration is supporting that work and supporting your ability to do it. I think that in summary, it's better than my stream of consciousness. And I don't know how much time I have, Randy, do I have any more time or is that it? Randy, I can't hear you. Randy, if you're talking, you're on mute. That's good. I think if you've got one or two more key points you'd like to make about the stewardship group putting a funding request forward, that would be excellent. Sure. Um, I will say very quickly that um, Congress wants the president's budget to have whatever you want it to have, if you want Congress to do something about it. So you need to work with your agency partners and you need to work from the bottom up uh, to get them to support changes or increases or decreases, if that's what you would like. It starts in forests at the district level, in parks at the unit level, um, in the BLM and fish. I don't work with them at their lowest administrative units, but whatever they are, you want to get the um, you want to get your volunteer coordinator on board. You want to get the district ranger. You want to get the forest supervisor, the regional forester, and so on, um, up and up and up. And what's always important to do is in making your case within the executive branch to make your case as you can in the framing that the executive branch has provided. So for instance, if you want more support for um, wilderness stewardship, you look at the executive orders that President Biden has published and you find what in those executive orders supports the um, increased attention to and increased funding of the management of wilderness areas. And then you reference those things when you speak to your agency partners and you say, the president has said this, we believe this um, desire that we have is in line with the president's policy directions. And we'd like to understand how we can work with you to support you and to support us and this trust resource that we manage cooperatively or jointly. Done. All right, well, thank, thank you very much, Brandon. We appreciate you coming on and sharing about the importance of budgets. Uh, so that's how, like you say, how things get driven. All right, so we've talked about getting a meeting with a member and we've talked a little bit about committees. We've got one other special topic uh, dealing with the way Congress is organized and that's around other congressional groups. So Andrew, you wanna tell us a little bit about caucus, caucuses and other special interest topics that Congress may form around. Yeah, and I, I think this part was actually Brendan as well, just to talk about 
caucuses mm. in the context of the AT caucus, which is a, a fairly recent um, body. Uh, sure, how to talk about this. So um, caucuses are an organizational tool within the chambers and sometimes they are bicameral. And what you should think about when you think about caucuses is that a lot of the time they're like bumper stickers. Sometimes they're like carpools. So a member can be a member of a caucus and they can be a member of that caucus because they are interested in that topic or that topic is important to their constituents. Um, and they either want to show support without doing anything, or they want to show support by doing something and being active. So for instance, the Congressional um, Appalachian National Senior Trail Caucus was founded by Don Byer of Virginia and um, Dr. Burchett of Tennessee a couple of Congresses ago, um, I think in the 114th Congress. Uh, because those are two members who love the AT and want to do something, um, wanted to do work for the AT uh, and not just have a bumper sticker. Um, and so, you know, Mr. Or, excuse me, Dr. Burchett was interested in, in founding this caucus because he has hundreds of miles. He has since retired, but he had hundreds of miles of the AT in his district. And it was critical for, um, you know, the, the health and the economic viability and um, the scenic beauty of his district, and he recognized that. And Don Beyer has a, a deep and long um, standing love of the AT and wanted to um, elevate the AT in the thinking of uh, members of Congress because Don Beyer is one of those people who has an extremely diverse range of interests. And usually you get to serve those interests by sitting on committees and doing substantive legislative work on the committees. And um, Don Beyer was moving away from having a seat on the committees that would let him do work on these issues. So one of the reasons why he established this caucus was to remain engaged and advance um, issues of interest of his regarding to public lands and natural resources within a context that he cared deeply about specifically the Appalachian Trail. So there are caucuses like the, um, App, the Congressional Appalachian National Scenic Trail Caucus, and I would add that in the House, they often say congressional because they bill the things that they do as being bicameral when they're often limited to the House, which is, a, as a Senate alum, something that strikes people in the Senate sometimes as funny. Um, so there are no Senate members of the Congressional AT Caucus. It's not organized in the Senate. Caucuses are organized under the chamber's own rules. Um, so you have caucuses like the AT Caucus, and then you have caucuses that folks may have heard um, a lot more about because they pop up in the news, like the Freedom Caucus, which is full of um, conservative members of the Republican Party who have a particular view on limited government. Uh, and there is another caucus that is similar to the Freedom Caucus in terms of how it operates. And that's the um, Problem Solvers Caucus, which is um, led by Josh Gottheimer, an AT congressman, member of our caucus. And what makes these two caucuses, just as examples, different from the AT Caucus, is these caucuses have adopted formal rules that determine that if they consider a piece of legislation or a policy topic and come to an agreement by a certain percentage of their membership to support or oppose, the entirety of the caucus will support or oppose that legislation. So for the sake of argument, if there's a bill that goes forward that uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus considers and votes as a caucus to support, then all of the Republicans and all of the Democrats on that caucus will support that legislation. If there's a piece of legislation that they agree to oppose, then all of those Democrats and all of those Republicans will vote against that piece of legislation. And so these kinds of caucuses are different than the AT caucus because most caucuses are more formal information distribution and discussion networks 
they're not designed to operate as voting blocks. Um, but when you do have a caucus that operates as a voting block, which I think is difficult for us in this line of work um, to achieve, then that changes the calculus for the floor leadership and for committee leadership on what kind of legislation is developed and how it is moved. So for us, and maybe I'm wrong, and you know, Anders and others may have different opinions on this, but if we were working on a piece of legislation that one of these block caucuses opposed, it would at least make it more difficult for us to get our kind of wonky, what should be very bipartisan issues through um, than if a block caucus took no position on it. And block caucuses sort of fall into the same advocacy category as scorecards that are, and I know that I'm not supposed to talk about this, but sometimes scorecards don't actually reflect what the best policy is. They just add an additional political consideration that is really designed to, I think, benefit certain members rather than it is to punish other members. Um, but then we're getting into like potentially a philosophical argument rather than a practical argument or discussion. Sorry, none of us are arguing. We're all friends. Yeah. Well, let's not go there today. Yeah. We'll save it for another day. <laughs> um, that's the Senate doesn't like caucuses by and large. Um, and part of that has to do with the, the functions, the, the means by which members get attention for things and um, the way that it's a PR thing as well. And also because, because there are fewer senators and they sit on more committees, senators individually have more of an ability to impact a policy area or raise the profile for a particular issue than members of the House do. So House members affiliating themselves with, I don't want to say interest groups, but with uh, an issue of interest to them and some kind of framework to advance that issue. Um, it, it's much easier for a House member to do that. It, it's more becoming, one could argue, of a representative than it is of a senator. Um, but it, that's just a quirk between chambers and how they approach their work. And it's, I mean, it's sort of like very inside the beltway nonsense sometimes. Yeah, yeah I, I would add that um, back in the 90s, there was there was a wilderness caucus. Um, it has since um, sort of disbanded and not very not no activity. We'd like to see a, a wilderness caucus reestablished in the future. And I know Lisa Ronald, who is with the Wild and Scenic Rivers Coalition on this call, has been actively working with some of the members to try to develop a, a wild and scenic rivers caucus uh, to get more emphasis and attention put on wild and scenic rivers. So I, while we don't, oh, go ahead, Ben. I have one more thought to that. Um, okay. It is in, imperative that you as a wilderness steward or as a supporter and advocate for any particular issue um, you help keep that caucus alive. The fire will generally burn itself out if it is not well tended. And just because you have a caucus or get a caucus, your work is not ended. I have to have regular contacts with the members of the AT caucus, one to remind them that they're in the caucus and remind them that there are things that they can do to help us in our work. But also because, you know, Phil Rowe retired at the end of the last Congress, and we then had to find a Republican co-chair of our caucus. And it's been increasingly difficult to recruit Republican trail members into the caucus because of the change in the politics in the party and because of the drawing of district lines and how many miles of trail and how connected to the trail each district is and so on and so forth. So 
we were lucky that um, Representative Burchett was willing and excited to become the coach, the new Republican co-chair of our caucus. But um, if we had not built up a relationship, if we did not invest in that relationship over time um, and did not continue to invest in that relationship and communicate with that office about issues of importance to them that connect to the AT, then they would lose interest. Um, and other Republicans, for instance, just for the sake of argument, may find it difficult to join a caucus where there is you know, maybe one Republican and 14 Democrats. So more issues should be bipartisan. And I think that we genuinely have bipartisanship at the core of what we work on, but you have to keep at it. You have to keep telling those stories. You have to keep speaking to those people. Otherwise they forget or they'll never learn. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry. My, my, um, ah, my desktop's going crazy on me. Anyways, let's move on here. Um, and we're in the home stretch on this webinar. You'll notice in this picture that in front of the congressional members, they look like they had big briefing books and some other other documents. So it's important that that people have materials of information. This is how we keep capture key pieces of information that we're going to use in working with um, Congress. And so the, the key ones that you're gonna be looking at and thinking about for yourself, of course, talking points. The, the, the gist, the summation, the key points that you want to get across when you're in a meeting, you want to have those summarized into why it's important, what the topic is, why it's important, why it matters. You want to have that in a succinct, um, hopefully nice, graphically organized way, because you will talk from these in your meetings, but you also might want to leave it as a takeaway for the person that you're meeting with so that they can refer to it after you're done with your meeting. Um, the other types of documents that you might have or, or consider developing would be briefing books or briefing papers. They allow you to go into more detail about your subject, about your topic. They allow you to provide pictures, uh, graphics, um, give you the, the background about a topic, give you a, um, a better understanding of what's involved, who the players are, um, and why this, uh, this particular topic is important and some of the ramifications that might result because of the implementation of it. So those briefing papers, those briefing books can take lots of different forms. Um, you know, it's really whatever is important to you and what you think the audience would be receptive to is the, the best way to go about doing that. Um, then the, another document might be a position paper. Now you'd be surprised, but in each of the congressional offices, they have notebooks that are just full of position papers. And it's the position that the congressman or the senator takes on any particular issue. So if you pick any topic, they might have a position paper on it, usually a one pager that goes into what the position is, why they think it's important, what the topic, you know, how, how this position was developed, um, the ramifications of it. But it, it's sort of their brain as to what, how they're going to vote on any particular topic. And you might consider developing position papers on some topics as to why you would want somebody to vote a particular way. And then again, share that with the congressional member as appropriate. And then finally, propose legislation. Now often Congress has their own ways of going about developing legislation. Those attorneys that sit in the committees craft a lot of it, uh, but sometimes the Local groups can develop legislation, at least can provide the key points that they would like to see involved in legislation that you can provide them to the congressional office to develop into a more formalized package of legislation. And so that's another key thing for you to consider, um, including in this suite of materials that you would have available uh, to move forward. 
Andrew and Andrews, anything else you'd like to talk about with materials? Um, I got a couple thoughts. I think knowing where Randy touched on an important point is that this is something that you're going to probably leave behind with a with a member's office, but it's also also going to um, kind of be an outline of your conversation. So one thing I like to do is have a copy um, of the leave behind as well and just work through it, you know, really walk them through the points um, kind of line by line, so to speak, um, so you can better guarantee uh, knowledge of the subject at hand. And so when they open this um, leave behind or open their folder from the day later and they got your leave behind, they remember what it's all about. Um, and, and, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, you gotta be very deliberate. So like pointing to things on the page while you talk about it, moving through it. Also, uh, remembering that this leave behind, is probably not the only one that they're going to get that day and probably not the only one that they get that week. And so you're going to be in a stack and making sure that your document stands out. Um, and one of the, one of the most important ways it stands out is that it's, not too uh, burdensome to look at. It's 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 well laid out. Not too much language on it because we all know from our work and you know working with the public and and public signage and trailhead signs and things like that. People don't read that much. Don't like to read. Just like they don't like to, you know, go up steps. And so um, making it really simple, succinct, visually attractive, walking them through it. So the next time that they pick it up, as they're prepared to brief their boss, it all makes sense. They can go to it, talk intelligently from that document or, or well-informed rather from that document is really important. So um, yours is going to be in a stack of a bunch of them and um, making sure that as they're rifling through them, or, you know, they drop them in the hallway, let's say yours stands out, I think is really important. All right. So as a teaser, we've got the... the next upcoming webinar is our ask workshop that's coming up in October. And as a preparation for that, I would like each of you to answer a question for us. You know, we've talked about the ask. The ask is really that what you want from Congress. What is it that you are looking for? And um, what you want Congress to pay attention to, whether it be more money, more legislation, a fix to some sort of piece of legislation or rule or regulation or to an adoption of a new program. Um, so I'd like each of you to take this poll so that we can prepare our way into the next, next workshop. Tell us what's important to you and we'll consider that as we work through the topics in our next webinar. All right, we'll give it another minute or give it another minute here. Well, there's certainly some interest in more funding for stewardship. The wilderness legislation uh, to designate more wilderness seems to be the majority, as well as more agency staffing for wilderness areas seem to be the three topics that most people here are wanting to put their weight behind. Okay, well, we have um, used our time today. I wanna to thank our speakers, Andrew and Anders, and give one last minute for any questions that people have that they would like to see responded to. Um, I don't believe we've had any in the chat to this point, um, but we'll give it just a second. If there are any other questions that people would like to ask. Well, I'm not seeing any, so Andrew and Anders, you're off the hook for questions today. Again, if you do have any in the audience, you can just email them to either Andrew, Anders, or myself. Um, they've left their email messages in the 
or emails in the in the chat. And this webinar will be um, downloaded and posted to the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance website within the coming days. I uh, want to thank you again for participating in this ongoing series about wilderness stewardship advocacy. We just ask that you guys all continue to do your, your part to advocate for wilderness in the settings that you find yourselves in. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you in October where we'll dig much deeper into the, the ask and develop a, a set of asks that we can share with um, our congressional representatives in November as part of the National Wilderness Workshop. So thanks everybody. Uh, this is Randy Welsh. Um, we'll call it for today. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you all.